So by way of personal introduction, I'm Mark Huxley. I'm the senior warden at the Company of Entrepreneurs, and it's fallen to me to facilitate uh, the panel session this evening. Um, we've broadly got an hour, um, but this is your time, not, not necessarily just the panel's time. So really want to try and get a debate. I mean, you've had some great stuff shared in your workshops today, lots of chatter going on. It feels like there's been a lot of, lot of enthusiasm going around. Tim sagely words a while ago. So what I'm going to do, I'm obviously going to introduce the folks, but I'm just going to ask a couple of questions, just as a scene setter. And then I really, really would love you guys to get involved, and obviously particularly the, the students amongst us. Um, lovely that the grown-ups want to say, but we kind of do the grown-up bits. This is your world you're coming into. This is a topic you know, much more relevant uh, to, to you at your age than, than it will be to definitely me at my age. So. All I'd say is there's only one silly question in the world, and that's the one you don't ask. So if there's something that's been burning around in your head during the course of the day, please talk about it. Please do it. Make my job easier, because they've made me stand up for an hour. So um, I want a nice, easy time. So I'll just do a quick rundown of, of intros of our panel. Um, Tim, you know, so forgive me, Tim. I won't reintroduce you, because um, everyone knows who you are. To Tim's... Left is Veronica Heaven. Uh, Veronica's managing director of the Heaven Company, which is a sustainability communications consultancy that uses its expertise and management support in communications, helping businesses around corporate social responsibility, which, again, we heard much, much of which from, from Tim. We then have Peter Hewitt, um, who is a multi-time business founder, now chairman of Universal Defence and Security Solutions Limited, which helps the UK defence and security um, experts use their expertise to our, our nation's partners and allies. Uh, he's a past master entrepreneur. Most importantly, and we need to recognise, was actually the founder and the architect of the Raleigh Lecture in its first year. And I think this is number four, if not number five, that, that we've done. So <clears throat> we always thank you for that, Peter. Um, and then we have Alistair Owens, uh, who is a professor of historical geography at Queen Mary's University and president of the Geographical Association 22-23. So I guess that makes you a past president, does it? Yeah. Still current president, okay. Um, but you may have seen within your resource books that, that Anthony, sorry, actually, Alistair was the, the author of the Sustainable City Solutions paper that, that you read. So, right. So as I said, a couple of quick questions. Get your brains thinking. Think about the questions to come back. So, Tim, you must not take this personally, but I'm going to ignore you yet again because you spoke very eloquently for 40, 45 minutes on the, the topic that we had about is enterprise sustainable, its impacts and external, external, externalities in business today. And I'm going to kind of, I think, to, to make sure we're all on the same page, let's just kind of run down from you, Veronica, and down, so you need to take the microphone. We've got a, a nice little sharing microphone between Hopefully us. Hopefully you can hear me? You hear me? Okay. Yep. So just, if the three of you just could kind of unpack for a few minutes what this topic means to you personally. So this topic is really sort of, if you like, my bread and butter. It's what I've been working on for a number of years. So my background is in forestry pulp and paper. So what that basically means is the issues that we talk about today in terms of sustainability, talking about you know, how important it is for the planet, how important it is in terms of social affairs and human rights and supply chains. These are the sorts of things that I've been working on for a number of years, working from that, from that backdrop, basically. And I think there's just so many drivers that we're now seeing that are, have come to play. And so from my personal perspective, as someone who's worked in this space for a very, very long time, it's, it's very sort of rewarding to see that we can have a discussion about sustainability. And all of you here in the room today know what sustainability is. And 10 years ago, you probably wouldn't have, you know, most people say sustainability, oh, what does that mean? Ooh, I have no idea what that means. So I think we're at a place now where we can talk about things such as sustainability, environmental, social, and governance. And people are actively engaged in the topic and understanding what it is. And there's just so many drivers now that are coming forward. And Tim very ably spoke about the CSRD, the reporting requirements, and that really is going to take a big effect on many companies because the shift is it's gone from being something that is voluntary that you could choose to do 
and it's become something that will become mandatory. So by 2024, companies will have to start be really taking a lot, a lot of this work. And by 2025, January 1st, 2025, will be the first year of their full reporting. So there's a lot that's now coming forward. Now, I could talk for ages, so I'm going to stop at that point. But just to say that there's a lot of different drivers, and it's about employees, it's about communities, it's about supply chains, it's about investor interest. So for me, all of these things, we're coming to this point of this intersection where it's all coming together. And, you know, we really just want to make sure that we're doing the best that we can do for the broadest sense of communities and the widest level of stakeholder engagement. So that's what we're now seeing. That's the time that we're, at, we're, we're now at. And my final thing to say before, I'm sure we'll have other questions on this, but my, my final thing to say is that we've reached this point now where because of the level of investor interest, which is driving the amount of corporate reporting that we're seeing and will see in the future, this space has finally grown up. It really has finally grown up. And there's a saying, you know, if you want to know what's happening, follow the money. And I think basically where we have financial institutions, investors really interested in this space, that's what we're now seeing. Is that okay for you? Very good. Yeah, please. Thank you, Veronica. Um, I'm going to come at this from a slightly different direction. So um, I set up my first business when I was 24 um, and have had an awful lot of businesses since then. The really hard thing is the profit bit. And as I was talking to the, the guys earlier, um, the difficult thing is to make sure that you're not in a situation where your, your house is on the line and it's actually called for to be repossessed. Um, I've been sort of near that occasionally. And the, as you come to the end of the month and I've got to pay the PAYE, pay the VAT, um, and pay the salaries, this is really sleepless night stuff. So what I find interesting is where is the trade-off? between, and I'm thinking smaller companies, I'm not thinking about the big, you know, the kinetics and the, and, and the big quoted public companies, but the small companies that the likes of you guys will be setting up. Um, that is really difficult to do the ESG bit. So I would, I would slightly maintain in a smaller company, and unless of course you're a, an environmentally sustainable business in itself, like selling clothes or something obvious like that, that actually a business such as consultancy and you know, accountancy, banking, finance, whatever, that's not so obviously sustainable, that actually this comes when you start to make profits and that actually you can start to plow it back and you can start to do good things. So that would, that's really where I'm coming from and I think there's a bit of a difference between being a quoted public company where you've got different accounting standards to that of your small company, but you've got to start at being a small company before you can become a big company. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I'm a geographer. I'm an academic, so I, I don't work in business. But sustainability is a, it's a core idea right at the heart of geography. And I think geography as a discipline is great because geographers are naturally problem solvers. And they look outside of their discipline of geography to try and think about how we can tackle some of these major world challenges and that includes actually and certainly in my institution where I teach which is Queen Mary here in London uh, we work with people in our school of business and management and uh, a line that came from Tim's lecture just before our refreshments was climate risk equals business risk so geography is an area where we can think about that and actually think about what it means to uh, maintain business sustainability and prof profitability into the future when we face this major global crisis. So geographers also think about you know, the, the geographical variability of this challenge. So we heard also in the lecture before our break about how in the European Union, people are embracing this idea of the need for greater regulation for businesses to think more about their, their climate impacts. But would that model work in other parts of the world? Would that model work in South America? Would that model work in, in the US? Would it work here in the UK? We know there are some quite um, interesting political differences. And in the context of things like Brexit, uh, what the Europeans are doing might be a difficult thing to sell to some parts of, um, of the UK um, business uh, sector. So there, there are lots of things, I think, um, raised by this really fascinating topic uh, for debate. And I think I'll, I'll leave it there for now, but look forward to hearing other comments and questions. Thank you. So, Tim, you're, you're finally going to get your time to speak now. So, passing back down to you, I mean, 
when you were giving your lecture, you talked about that difference between shareholder values and stakeholder values sitting in there. And I, I, I just wonder, I wondered as you were speaking, and this affects some of the things I do in my, my daily work life, that there's a lot of talk about the stakeholder economy. There's very little walking towards a stakeholder economy. Profit is still seen as the, as the, as the, the place to be. And the byproduct of that, of course, is you end up with kind of good actors and bad actors. You've got people that want to do the right thing and come together and tragically, so my the United Nations um, put together this net zero insurance alliance, which worked well for 18 months, and now four of the world's largest insurance companies have chosen to leave it because they're worried about what it's doing and, and the technicality around antitrust, which we don't need to get into here. But actually, they feel they're better you know, sailing their own ship into their own future. But of course, that means you've got single interests coming back in, which gets you away from your stakeholder. So sorry, this is turning into a very long question. So where do you think, and how far down the log do we have to go to crisis before we get to a genuine, collegiate, single macro view over everything, as opposed to, I'd like to be a macro view, but I've got to worry about my micro economy? I think we have a long way to go. Um, that, uh, I think the idea of stakeholder capitalism is a direction in which we need to go. Is that, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I think that's the direction we need to go, because I think uh, neoliberalism has created a lot of problems. And I think when uh, Klaus Schwab talks about um, that the Friedmanite model is no longer sustainable, I think he's right. However, having said that, uh, I talked about engine number one, this tiny company in San Francisco uh, with three members on the Exxon Board of Directors. And they got onto the Board of Directors because they convinced the shareholders that the company was not going in the right direction, um, that climate risk is business risk, and Exxon was not paying enough attention. So they got onto the, they, they got onto the board. But the interesting thing about engine number one is that it was not motivated by ESG. It was motivated by profit. It said, if we want to be profitable, we've got to play the game. Because going back to what I was saying about people like Larry Fink at BlackRock, I mean, think of it, $10 trillion of assets under management, $10 trillion. And saying to investors, we should move away from companies that, for instance, uh, are uh, focused on, on uh, fossil fuels. So I think that we still have very much a kind of neoliberal approach to business where profit is still king. But what I'm hoping is that over time, this is my own personal hope, uh, is that we'll move away from that model and move more towards stakeholder capital. Because I think that is the model for the future in which climate change and adherence to the principles of climate change and CSRD and ESRS, I think that's, that's where the, uh, the future lies. That's what I think. Peter, yep. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that. I'm going to sort of go back a step here. The problem we have is that, uh, well, it's not a problem that I'm chairman of a publicly quoted company, but um, the priorities are quite simple. We have a duty to shareholders, and that's it. That's number one thing. Other issues that we have to report on are a different matter. And if I can pick up on, on the point you just made, that, that stakeholder capital, um, that we've got shareholders and stakeholder values, the problem is stakeholder capital doesn't pay salaries. And at the end of the day, that's what you've got to do. And so I think there's a, there's a dangerous distraction that making money at the bottom line, paying shareholders, of which may well be the pension funds, who are in turn making money and profit for their investors, is perhaps the important thing. So I'm arguing slightly, somewhat that actually making profit is a good thing. Yes, we mustn't ignore stakeholder capital, but it doesn't pay salaries. Can I, can I, I, just want to, I just want to make a quick comment about that, because I want to come back to engine number one and the idea that they were 
So driven. Tim, Tim, just that they were driven by profitability. They were not driven by any ethical, moral uh, sort of dedication to ESG issues and climate change and the rest of it. They said because of people, because of people like Larry Fink saying we're going to try to move our investors away from these big companies like uh, the, the oil companies, that if you want to make a profit, then you should show that, now this, this, is, this is going back to a focus on ESG, not so much stakeholder capital. You should promote the values uh, inherent in ESG and, and being picked up now by, say, CSRD and I'm very closely going to leave you to last because I want to ask you a oh, okay. slight variant on the question. So if you don't mind, All right. we can get Alistair's view first. Um, yeah, I think there's a slight difference here. That that uh, what I what I think is important is that stakeholder value is recognised and acknowledged and reported on, but one must not lose focus of shareholders because they are the guys who own the company and they are the guys who need a return. So, Peter, to Alistair. Same question? Yeah, uh, yes, please. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. I suspect we share more in the panel than we have in terms of differences on some of these things. I think maybe that this needs complicating a little bit because uh, we know that shareholders can be quite active in, in trying to uh, change the way. Uh, companies work and we've seen that shareholder activism in in a number of different places so shareholders who who may want to to push for change as we've we've heard from examples and then the other bit of this we haven't said anything about yet is the role of consumers actually so everybody in this room often so those who consume products and services from business how they can actually be a really powerful force in in pushing for change in relation to some of these issues and I think there's another tension here isn't there between the kind of short-term need to make profit and then this you know longer term issue which is still absolutely fundamental to to business success and profits in that that longer term so there's a lot of diff difficult things to try and try and square here and i think you know we all recognize that it's a balance that's got to be struck between them for a reason i wanted to kind of leave you to last was because knowing you were more around social responsibility and the kind of inclusivity of the people that are going to drive some of these economies rather than the businesses driving it. I was just interested, you know, to get your, your more kind of people, the S of ESG sitting in there. Yeah, well, I think the thing, for me, what's interesting, and it's picking up on points that have been said across the board, really, which is that the first question is, what's the company's responsibility? Is it primarily to make a profit? Now, let's be clear, without making a profit, you don't have a business. You need to be able to make a profit to have a sustainable business. That can then do all the great things that we're talking about and that you want to do. So that's a given. So what I want to say also is that as directors of companies, which we all are, and many of you will become directors of companies, I would imagine, in the future because of your interest in this, there's something within the Companies Act which is known as Section 172. Section 172 is really clear about the role of directors. And actually, the broadest interest of, of, a, of a company is to take long-term decisions, to act in the interest of stakeholders. That includes, includes employees, communities, suppliers. So all the things that we're talking about here in terms of the broader ESG agenda are actually within the Companies Act. So if we want to adhere to, you know, if we're already doing the, if we're, we, as, we've, as I've just said, you need to make a profit to be a sustainable business in the first instance, otherwise you have no business to continue to do the, all the good stuff. Sorry, I can hear a buzz going over. Um, but I think from a people point of view, the whole thing here is this is where we're talking about bringing on board our people with us. That's all around, sorry, that's, that's my phone going, I do apologize for that. Um, I thought I switched it off on silent, but it's all around people. It's about the communities, it's about the human capital, it's about making sure that we have our supply chains on board, that we're looking at the broadest sense of social development and how we can, we can do more and do better. So, you know, there's two really major trends that we're seeing in terms of the ESG agenda, two of the big mega trends, really. And one is the big response to climate change because we all have to have a responsibility towards that. But the second big mega trend is actually all around to do with people and how we take people, communities, and have that societal leadership piece as part of it. Um, 
Diversity, equity, inclusion, there's a lot of things that have been going on um, more recently that has really pushed this. But there's a lot to be done and it, you know, we need people to make all of that happen. Thank you, thank you. So I, I said before, I really want to just, a couple of great answers to a couple of great questions. Just, I want to pass it over to, to you guys, but before that, and just so we can read the warmth or otherwise in the room to the topic, just on a kind of simple, simple show of the hands, if you don't mind, how many of you are really actively caring about what's happening in the climate at the moment? Okay. How many are kind of passive neutral that you care about it, but it's kind of someone else's problem? And how many of you... That's really interesting. Okay, so I thought we were going to go from lots of you caring to some of you not being so caring. And the last question was, how many of you really don't give a monkeys about what's going on? I just want to get on with my life and damn the planet, pardon by the language. Is there anybody who's willing to put their hand up to say that? Thank God for that. So, right. so the, the, the good news is we're all a caring audience. There's a little bit of antipathy amongst some of you to, to is this about me today, which... You know, could, could be because of where you are in your, in your studies and could be a little bit more relevant in a couple of years. Good, okay. So look, I'm going to pause. Is there anybody that wants to ask any question on anything? And it doesn't need to be about these two questions. It could be anything that's come up today, anything that's triggered a thought in your mind that you'd like to unpack a little further. I have lots of questions I can ask these folks, so don't worry about that if, if there's not. Yeah? Thank you. Front row. Thank you, Duncan. To, Young lady in the back. to run a bit faster, I think. There you are. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I want to ask the question, you know, with startups, what are some practical solutions or just tips to implement when you're, like, creating a startup? How can you actually be sustainable? Because I know for large co larger companies it might be easier, but smaller companies, as you said, it's not easy. So how, what can you actually do? Thank you for the question. So... Some of the simplest things to do is just thinking about your everyday purchasing decisions. So simple things like if you need to buy photocopy a paper, what paper did you choose to buy? Is it a certified paper? Is it a recycled paper? So very simple things can be done. Really, really tiny, tiny thing. All in sort of the smallest decisions all count. Now, what's interesting is for small businesses, it's often much easier for them to be sustainable because they're smaller. They may have uh, local supply chains that they're working with. They may be able to support a local ecosystem in terms of you know, working locally with others and supporting local businesses. And those things can help to generate more sustainable actions. Um, for me personally, a simple thing that's easy to do is where possible, stay local and support local businesses, local infrastructures, try and do that. Um, but there's lots of small things that can be done, very, very small things, just like you know, where, where you choose to buy your energy from. Can you choose a green tariff rather than a standard tariff and what difference does it make? So because of the space that I operate in and as a personal belief, I've always sort of very much believed in making the most sustainable decision. It's little things. Where do you choose to have your, your, your offices or where do you, how do you want to transport people around? There's lots and lots of tiny, tiny everyday decisions that can be taken that make a difference. Feel free if you have anyone else. Yeah. Thanks. Um, it, it's an excellent question. Uh, in, a, in my little group earlier on, we were talking about um, how COVID has perhaps made some businesses a bit more sustainable by not having meetings in person, but by doing a lot of Teams and Zoom. Um, but interestingly, I did ask them um, whether they thought this was good for the business and for them as individuals, and 100% said no, they would need to work from the office. So I suppose in some ways, you know, a question to ask a small business and something that's been completely within your control, do I have a meeting in person and have to travel to it? Or can I do it over Zooms and Teams? And from my perspective, now, I always have a first meeting on Zoom or Teams because it may be a waste of a meeting anyway. So um, think about that and that's, uh, that, that will be my sort of top tip, really. Tim, I say, uh, no. No, okay, all right. So uh, maybe let's pick up on that uh, comment then Veronica made about 
local supply chain miles, you know, live local, eat local, do local. What do you guys think about the fact you are probably the first generation that will have to make big compromises in the way you live your life about if we're going to have a route to carbon zero, that will be the way you travel around, maybe less foreign travel, not getting to explore the world in, in, in a way that it was done before. And this is maybe in the absence of biofuels and carbon zero ways of doing it. Definitely food supply chain miles, I think is, is a big one. More expensive clothing, so clothing for life, not disposable clothing. And I, I, really, I would encourage some answers to this from, from you folks. Are you ready to make those compromises? Do you think it's fair that you are the generation that will be asked to make those compromises? Or again, you know, with that slight antipathy of where we are, is it right, well, I'll do it when I have to do it, but I'm not going to do it before. Anyone got some thoughts on that? Yeah, no, gentlemen, right next to you. There we go, Daniel. Hi. Um, I think that actually, as generation, we should kind of give these things up because if we don't, I think it's much worse for other people. And we might say it's not fair for us that the generations before us got to experience these things. But if we say, why is it fair for us to miss out on it, we're pushing it onto the next generation and that's us making a conscious decision to make it worse. And I think we should give up some things. Um, if we were talking about this earlier in the group uh, discussion when we first walked in, we have a very focused sort of political environment on constant growth. You know, if GDP's down, people don't like that. And I think that's not exactly great because to turn sustainable, there are gonna have to be sacrifices within the economy and in people's lives, um, whether it's, you know, not going abroad or eating locally or eating in season and similar. These sacrifices have to be made in order to like continue existence. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Anybody got a slightly different view on that, or do we, uh, Duncan, gentlemen? Oh, sorry, so I can't see. General Lack. How can we fund being sustainable if the economy isn't growing? Because surely we won't be able to, to afford to do it. I'm going to throw that question at you, Peter, because the, no, because it's the for profit. But actually, is there? Well, have we got to evolve into a different capital market structure that? Shareholder value is judged in a different way. Someone mentioned about impact investing and that side of it. Well, I suppose I'm, as you probably gathered, very much a sort of free market economist. And for me, the less regulation, the better. But um, I suppose the question I've got to ask the um, person who, who, who made the statement about we've got to sacrifice for the future. Now, whereas I applaud that, but are you going to give up your mobile phone? Uh, in order to achieve that goal. That, is that your small sacrifice and would you be prepared to do it? Um, and your holidays and, and possible motor cars and so on. So these are all hard questions and, and conceptually you're absolutely right. When it comes to the hard reality though, it, it becomes a completely different question of, you know, am I going to lose my mobile phone? Or something similar that's, that's important to us. Um, so far as that, we, uh, and I think your question was, we need growth in order to fund sustainability. Was that, that, that basically your statement? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, totally. I think, uh, go back to, to, to right to the, the heart of it, making a profit is a good thing because it allows us to do so many other things. It is, it is freedom. It allows us to spend money in the way we want to spend it, which may well be on ESG type things, as a, speaking as a corporate. Um, so more money we can make in the bottom line, the better it is, simply put. Peter, you, uh, sorry, Peter, I, I've, I've got a little additional question to that. So, I, mean, I mean, to me, there, there, there's kind of two economies and, a, and an emerging economy in the middle. So there, there's a green economy, you've got lots of startups, you think about energy, business like Octopus that, that sit out there doing what they're doing. You've got the brown economy, you know, the traditional pollutant economy, and you've, you've got the bit that's kind of in the middle. How dangerous is the greenwashing bit in the middle that it well, all think, becomes a compromise? Yeah, I mean, I think all businesses are businesses. It's a sort of fundamental fact. How they're sustained, whether they're getting more money from government grants or uh, there's, um, they're supported by government. I mean, if you take, for example, an interesting 
company called Satellite Applications Catapult. Now, this is a, probably not many of you heard of it, but the government set up loads of these catapults in order to project the future, to look at science, and in particular the one I'm familiar with, which is the Satellite Applications Catapult. So, so they're basically government funded, but they have to make money. So they're not wholly supported by grants, uh, but they have a gap they've got to fill by raising money. So that's an interesting model. Um, and of course, there are, there are various other companies that, but essentially, they have to make money because at the end of the day, that's what it's about. Tim, I understand, have you got any? Thank you. I wanted to go back to your, your first question and really just to challenge a little bit on whether all those things you were describing are necessarily sacrifices or compromises, I think was the word you originally used. So uh, yesterday, for example, I ran a half marathon in a part of East London where lots of the roads were closed. And the way that that transformed the place I live in by people coming out and having a really good time, you know, there's lots of people uh, dancing, shouting in the streets as we, we ran by, um, bands, all sorts of things going on. People reclaiming the city locally cars weren't allowed. That was a really wonderful experience, actually. And of course, that can't happen all the time. But there are some advantages of, of reclaiming the local. The other thing I'd say is that uh, in a city like London, too, um, you know, if one thing that we feel we would lose if we moved in this direction was that sense of having a global life, well, I think in London you have it anyway, because the local is very global in London, to speak quite geographically. So we can experience global food, global culture, music, fashion, all those sorts of things within this global city. We might want to rethink where we source some of those things from, but actually, I'm not sure that everything that's going to happen in the future will, will be negative as we move towards a more sustainable situation. Thank you. Oh, we've got lots of questions now. I'll say lady first, and then gentleman behind. So. Second row. This is a more theoretical question, I guess, but in your opinion, what was the single most significant event that led to the narrative that Friedmanism was no longer sustainable? Okay. Uh, could, could you repeat that? I'm sorry, I didn't like, catch everything. It had to do with the Friedmanite model, right? What was the single most significant event that led to the narrative that Friedmanism was no longer sustainable? Freedom in, freedomanism. Yep. Yep. Friedmanite. The Friedmanite model. Yes. Yep. So oh, Milton Friedman. And oh, Friedman. Oh, sorry. That's right. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I think um, if you read the article, uh, it was 13 September 1970 in the New York Times. I quoted part of it in my, in my talk. What, Friedman said about businesses. Um, and they have no responsibility to society. They have no responsibility to the community. Their only responsibility is to shareholders. Um, and when I read that, I thought, this is just wrong. I know that businesses need to make a profit. I have no problems with that. As we all recognize, everybody in this room recognizes without profit, businesses uh, cannot survive. But I think that businesses do have a responsibility to society. I think they do have a responsibility to the environment, to the community. So that's really what caught my attention. Is that okay? Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. I, 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 it's interesting, the question, really, because it, it's often quoted the whole Milton Friedman um, you know, the first responsibility of business is to make a profit and then the sort of turnaround in terms of, well, is that right still? And I suppose if you kind of look really, I'm jumping through different time zones really, but, you know, going back to, I guess, 270 years ago, you had the age of enlightenment. So the coffee shops of London were very much, um, you know, thought places where people would say, well, how can we do things? You know, there was lots of debate about the way things were being done and is this the best way? Could there be a better way of doing things? So there's been a historical context to sort of look at, you know, yes, main trade has to happen in, in, in a particular way, but I think the discussions 
haven't necessarily only been about, um, you know, just singularly around the profit model. Because at the end of the day, finance is only one metric, and that's the whole point of the whole message around ESG, which is that there's so much more to consider as well. And if you're wanting to think about social capital, human capital, you're thinking about all of the different met you know, areas that you can consider, there's a lot more. So I don't think there's sort of one single thing that's happened that made people think, oh, that's no longer the thing. But I think there's been this time of enlightenment and companies, and particularly in the past sort of, as I say, sort of 270 years or, or around that sort of time, there's been more and more that's been happening in that, in that direction. And you can think about companies like uh, John Lewis Partnership and their, their model, the cooperative group and their model. So there's always been this thing that you can actually make a profit and you can actually do something for society as well. But that also goes back into things such as the business models and business forms, how companies are organized. There's a lot of different things, and so I think it's not just a single thing that's happened. I think there's been a lot of different things that have been convening, and we're now at a point where all of those ideas have sort of coalesced into this point where we are now ready and understanding actually for the good of the planet, for the good of people, you know, the things that we're seeing in terms of climate change, the things that we're seeing in terms of just human resources and wastage and just, just so many different things that what we've done before could not continue as it has been. So it's a lot of different things rather than just one point, I would say. Thank you. We had a question from our gentleman there. Sorry. Evening. Um, this is kind of inspired from the Niger Delta essay and also Tim's lecture. To what extent do you believe it is hypocritical or unfair for more economically developed countries, such as that of the UK, to judge less economic, economically developed countries through the lens of double, materi double materiality when we got to develop in a world of economic materiality. <laughs> That's mine, apparently. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, hand over to Tim in a minute as well, I think, on that one. But I mean, I think, yes, I think there is a good deal that, that is unfair about that. Um, and, and the way, you know, we, we often claim now that we are a greener, more sustainable nation, and that's partly because the, the, the manufacturing and other economic activity that, that causes the harm is now done in another part of the world. Um, we've just moved it somewhere else and we consume those products um, from those places. So, you know, the, the point about supply chains is, is actually really critical, isn't it, in terms of becoming uh, economically sustainable. But I, I'm inclined to agree, you know, what right do we have to preach on these things when we spent the last 300 years you know, polluting the earth? I think unhelpfully I'll leave it there and pass the <laughs> microphone along. Yeah, thanks. Um, we did, of course, discuss this in our, um, in our forum. Um, and I think a lot of this, uh, the resulting problems stem from perhaps the types of government that may be in power in these particular countries, that if it is a, a sort of dictatorship and it's run by a few uh, corrupt individuals, then all the money and the profits that are, that are being made from these resources are being siphoned off into a few people's hands. What, of course, should be happening is it should be a democracy and it should be that that money is going back to the people and going back to the infrastructure. But, of course, that is somewhat of a utopian scenario. I love the question. And actually, interestingly enough, it came up in our group as well in terms of a discussion point. So um, it, it's an interesting thing because, of course, for us as developed nations, we feel as though everyone should be moving at the pace that we're moving at. And why are they, why, you know, why are they being laggards? Why are they doing less than they could be doing? Um, for me, what's interesting is that there are some sustainability initiatives that are really clear in the sense that you have to have an, a recognition of national standards and local laws for, company, for, for countries to move at the pace at which they are ready to move, rather than always going with the, the international standards. So, of course, the international standards are the, if you like, the utopia where we all want to get to, but we've got to recognize that different nations are at different points in their progress, uh, and there's ways to achieve it, but we also need to recognize that, you know, we've done a lot of damage in terms of getting the growth that we wanted to get to. Um, but also, we're not, but there are, we also recognize that some of my work is sort of international with global supply chains, and we, we recognize that, you know, in some countries, there are uh, government policies in place to make sure that only companies that are going in the right trajectory in terms of looking at the broadest 
uh, impacts, environmental concerns, etc., are the ones who get recognized with contracts. And there's a really active way of doing that. So, yeah, we don't have an absolute right, but we absolutely do want to encourage more and more of the better progress uh, and best practice to happen. Okay. At the back, Duncan. Uh, how will the government and economy ensure that in becoming more sustainable there isn't a worsening effect on the unequal distribution of wealth in the sense that richer people may not find it as challenging to change to more sustainable options than poorer people would? That's interesting. Actually, I, if I'm allowed to indulge for one comment, I, I found myself at another livery company's annual lecture last week in a room with Rory Stewart. And the whole topic there was about the rise of populism over the last 40 years, the increase in nationalism, the greater social divide, I think to, to your point that came out of it, and the stark rise, I can't remember the statistics, but the stark rise in extreme poverty around the world. And how arrogantly as Western nations we try and put balancing education in, bring our Western ideals to those economies when actually all they want is money because they can buy things with money. You know, he the, 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 quite the old phrase of, buy a man a fishing elite for a day, buy him a fishing rod elite for the rest of his life. And the answer was, we don't even want fishing rods. We just want to look after ourselves. So, sorry, there's a, a personal comment back to, to your question, but I think, and it was one of the themes I'd written down as something I think we, we should move this conversation into, the social divide and the equalization of that inequality that comes. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good question. So one of the projects I run is actually focused on uh, it's actually a, a master's in global governance and sustainable development, and it's focused on working towards a more sustainable and equitable future. I know it's a long title, but it really is focused on that, working towards a more, um, more sustainable and equitable future. And the, the reality of it is, is we do need to think about how we address the haves and the have-nots. And funny enough, some of the answers are around innovation and what can we bring, what are the, what are the learnings we can take from um, developed societies that can be introduced in a really simple way and accessible to more people. So, for example, there's a $3 phone that's available in India and it's available to farmers and normally mobile phones are thought of as a prestige item, you know, you've got your Apple iPhones, you've got all of these really prestigious things, but in the case of the Indian farmers, it's actually for a very different reason. It's accessibility, it's being able to, to make sure that things are being done in a much more sort of fair way for everybody. So my answer to this would really be, for all of us in the room, when we're thinking about how we can make sure that we have a more just and equitable society, it's about making sure that we have, you know, we're thinking about, it could be an existing idea, but could it be applied in a different way to have access for more people, you know, giving access to more people to have it, um, rather than all, only thinking about the elite elements that can afford things. I suppose the obvious one to me is that we need to redistribute wealth. Um, so for me, the answer is partly about taxation, taxation of incomes, but taxation of wealth so that we can share the burden of paying these things. But Alistair, taking that point, I mean, how, how do we go about that when we've got a very unfair world? We've got a world ridden by good actors, bad actors at every level of society, whether that's political or commercial to actually get an economy and a taxonomy that says, we will do this across the world. I mean, how do we make that happen? The theory is great. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean lots of economists ponder this. Um, lots of those on the left ponder how we might do this, and I don't think there is an easy answer. Uh, but fundamentally, we won't solve this problem if, if wealth is so unequally distributed. I mean, part of the answer, of course, lies in um, creating economic opportunities for all. So there is that possibility that people can, you know, generate wealth and therefore pay, pay for this kind of thing. And I think, you know, picking up on, on, on your point, Veronica, too, one thing we haven't really said a lot about at the moment is the potential for, for business to actually innovate in this space and actually to be something that helps us address these sustainability challenges. And in this, the small, um, the short article I wrote for the resource pack, I give some examples of that, where we've got innovators, where we've got entrepreneurs who are using their skills to, to actually solve some of these issues. So business is not always evil. Uh, business is quite often a solution. Um, however, coming back to the question, for me, fundamentally, I think in order to meet these challenges, we do need to redistribute wealth at a range of scales 
uh, locally, nationally, and indeed globally. Actually, I think Tim wants to add some words. Yeah, I was just thinking of uh, what Thomas Piketty uh, said about the reason for the huge inequities, the income gap, is that you have the return on capital is much larger than economic growth. So when you think of the financial collapse in 2008, the top 1% or the elite made huge amounts of money from it, whereas wages for the average worker stagnated. So this really brings me back to the topic I was discussing about the social market economy. So what you have in the social market economy is you've got the free market working, but you've also got the side that supports the people, the have-nots. And the responsibility of government is to intervene when there's an imbalance and come up with programs. It could be, as Alistair mentioned, it could be some sort of a redistribution plan. Uh, so that's, that's what I wanted to say. Hi, my name is Ezra. My question is for Peter Hewitt. What is your view on a mixed economy and what laws and regulations have specifically impacted you as a business person and that like, really annoys you as a business person? Awfully sorry, Mark, can you repeat that for me? Um, what are your views on a mixed economy and what regulations have really impacted you negatively as a business person and you wish would change? So regulation, negative impact given that apparently you don't like regulation or rules. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, so free market economy, regulation, yeah, these go hand in glove. Um, I think the important thing to do with regulation is to make sure that it, that it does what it says on the tin. There is a grave danger in the UK that we tend to gold plate everything. And certainly when it comes to regulation, and I remember speaking to uh, lots of Europeans and diplomats and so on, around the time of, of Brexit and saying, look, you know, we're, we're an island nation, we, we like making our own rules up, we don't want to be told what to do. But the reality was, when you were speaking to Ambassador from Luxembourg or Italy, and he said, the problem is with you guys is that you over-regulate and that you over-gold plate and you don't work the system. And that, of course, is what most European countries do, is if they don't like a particular rule, they tend not to adopt it. Uh, we in the UK, during our sort of um, European experience, tended to adopt everything and guess which way I voted, um, adopt everything and um, gold plate it and therefore it sort of hacked us off those in business where we, we, we just had too much regulation in some areas, not in all, but, but, but certainly in some areas. But do you see kind of, I mean, in my view, good regulation is where it becomes handrails not handcuffs. It's there just to guide you, just to stay as a kind of an honest corporate citizen. Absolutely right. But I think the also the thing we've got to remember with regulation, there will always be people who flout it. Exactly. So the danger is that we say, oh, somebody over there has done something wrong. Right, we must change the regulations. The reality is we probably shouldn't. We should, we should learn a little bit, but there are always going to be people who break the law. So there are always people who are speeding. Does that mean we bring the speed limit down every time? Um, no, it, it just means that's life. Mm. Does that answer your question? So we'll, just for the ease, gentlemen there, then we'll come to you. Evening, yes. Uh, quite a simple question, but in your opinions, what is the best way to teach people about sustainability? Thank you for the question. Um, so, interestingly enough, in our discussion group today, a lot was spoken about education being really such an important thing. Um, and it starts really at all levels, and it starts really young, so probably younger than we might imagine, actually. So there's simple things that can be taught to children of very sort of primary school age. Um, one of the programs that we run is actually called Architecture and Sustainability Looking to the Future. And we're teaching school children about the built environment, homes, climate change, insulation, all sorts of things. So it can be taught in very sort of, uh, sort of in, in digestible ways. And it's, it, 
it's actually sometimes going very, very simply to start off with and then giving practical applications that help to illustrate the point and allowing people to experiment and to test and to sort of work out, okay, well, what, what could be an answer to this thing? So the best way, I would say, is actually start as young as you dare to start because young people will grasp it, they'll understand it, they'll be like, you know, and I'm not just talking about recycle, etc., but it's the whole thing, you know, what does it actually mean to be, to, what does sustainability mean? A simple question like that, what does it mean? But we are set of school children and they're like, and they can give you an answer. They'll talk about durability, long-lasting products. They'll talk about things which, interestingly enough, we see mod business models now emerging and understanding that the perspective of growth isn't just about selling more, selling more, wanting more. It's actually how can you make more durable products? How can you make things last longer? How can you get customers to return to you for, from a loyalty point of view? So there's a lot of stuff that can come from it. Um, so I would say start young. Talk about it in, in general ways, everything from, you know, the food that you're cooking, where has it come from, through to, you know, not having waste. So it may be that you've cooked a bit of extra food, it goes into the, into the freezer, that can be a meal for another time. That's also being sustainable. There's lots and lots of small ways that you can implement sustainability and, and help people to understand it in sort of digestible ways. It doesn't need to be this really high polluted thing of course it is and it's very complex and it's a big issue and it's you know lots and lots of big stuff around it but the reality of it is there's some really simple things and in some ways it's almost going back in time sort of just keeping things a little bit simpler and that's a good way to teach it i, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> i'm just conscious we're, we're, uh, I'm, I'm sorry I'm just, I'm two words study geography <laughs> <laughs> so i think the mic was off <laughs> the gentleman behind you, Duncan. No, no, Duncan, sorry. Tap in the, the waistcoat. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so, Peter, as a young entrepreneur, how did you deal with failure? And what advice would you give to someone looking to get into entrepreneurship? Um, thank you for that. Um, sorry, I've realized I need some hearing aids and I'm getting old. Um, so advice about becoming an entrepreneur. I think, I think you've got to understand that it ain't as easy as you sometimes we portray it as. So it's going to be hard work. Be prepared for that. I think the rewards of running your own business and being absolutely responsible for absolutely everything are phenomenal. A lot of pressure, but a lot of fun. And once you've done it successfully, you will never look back. Um, Again, just go back to some of the things I mentioned earlier on about uh, you're going to have sleepless nights. Uh, you're going to have all this pain uh, that's going to go with running finances. Um, I think so far as the subject, what you, 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 you've got to be passionate about whatever it is you're going to be setting your business up in. This is super important because without the passion and without the absolute belief, you know, when you get those low moments, then uh, you, you're going to suffer. So believe in whatever it is. If you can find something unique, find something that has got a, a USP, um, something that's perhaps first if you're a technologist, and it depends so much in what subject you're doing. But perhaps most of all, try and keep it, as I was saying to the, the, the team on, on our round table, you've got to try and look at it as a cost of sales. So if you can, make sure that the expenses you have are balanced with the income, uh, well, in the right way. So um, look, at, look at doing deals. You've got to be really hard on the finance because at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is how much money is in the bank. When you've got money in the bank, uh, and then you can refine your offering and to include all some of these wonderful things that we all need to do. Um, but what subject are you particularly looking at, or are you thinking more generally? Um, as how so? Like, um, as in to begin a bus uh, to begin a bu business in? Is that what you mean? So, sorry, repeat that a bit <laughs> louder. Sorry, sorry. Thank you, that, the old man. So, are you questioning what um, sort of industry I want to start a business within? Or yeah, that was it. Yeah. yeah. Um, it'd be to do with cybersecurity. Cybersecurity. Ah, right. 
Um, you're, you're on a long suit now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is, um, yeah, you've got to be a bit of a techie. So there are many components to this cybersecurity business, um, not the least of which is being the techie and understanding some particular angle that you're after um, pursuing. Um, if, you, uh, if you contact me afterwards, I might be able to put you in touch with some people who will be able to, you need to get stuck into the industry first and understand the dynamics. Uh, either that or you need to be very seriously brilliant. And I'm not saying you're not, but if you are, then you've got your own idea and you'll, you'll run a, want to run with it. But sometimes working within, with other people first who are in the industry, you'll get a, get a good flavor. But, but, but um, I know a few people, and my wife, Fidelma, used to work in that industry, so um, happy to uh, have a chat afterwards if you want. And if I might be allowed to add something there, I think there's three great life lessons for you. It teaches you how to be resilient, how to actually face loneliness when you're, you're actually setting a business up, and to become extraordinarily self-aware, which actually makes, I think, makes you a, a good human being. So if I have three comments there. So, oh, so, so we'll take the gentleman behind you, then I think yours will be the last question, man in the red uh, This isn't just for Peter, this is for any of you, but do you think the UK's target of net zero in the time we've given ourselves is realistic? Is the UK tough enough on net zero? Okay, so net zero for basically, for hopefully many of you know what it is, but the long story short on this is this, this, there's this race to net zero and it's the United Nations race to zero. So by 2050, the UK and actually around the world, all governments, um, institutions, universities, everyone should be working towards trying to achieve this. So 2050 seems like a long way away. Um, what that basically means is if you're putting transition plans in place now, you have to be thinking about whether those transition plans are going to be taken up by your next CEO and how that's going to run through. So 2050 is a long-term goal, and that's a, you know it's, it's a, a lot can happen by that time, basically. And many of the people that are in businesses today won't be there by the time they get to 2050. That's that's part of the worry. Um, with some of the companies I'm working with, we have really very very ambitious targets, which which are achievable because they've been. We've been working on it for quite a bit of time. So we've got some ambitions to be uh, net zero by 2030 or 2035. So that's well, you know, well, well before the 2050 deadline. So some of the big businesses and some of the leading businesses are already pushing beyond it. The challenge and the problem is, uh, is actually the commercial realities and the market conditions and economic circumstances and so many things that have to be in place to make sure that all these things are achieved, as well as the longevity of the, the, the sort of planet, the, the strategic planning behind it. Um, there needs to be capex in place, that's you know, sort of capital expenditure in place, needs to be operating expenditure in place. There's a lot that needs to happen to make sure. But if companies have their transitions plans in place and they're working in a meaningful way to achieve it, then 2050, you know, that's supposed to be that outside level, and we basically need to achieve that as, as best we can. Some won't get there. Some will actually have to do lots of offsetting to be able to sort of move, you know, to be able to move the, the dial and say, okay, we're actually offsetting to be able to get to net zero. Um, because ultimately, your business is probably going to be, remain the same size or be bigger, and hopefully your business is growing. But somehow or other, you've got to be able to transition your business. And unfortunately for a lot of companies, that's going to mean extra cost. So how do you manage that extra cost that you're going to be imparting within the business? How are you going to manage that? Um, so the answer is, I think, as a world, 2050 is kind of like, yeah, we, we kind of have to get there. Um, but put it this way, we don't want to think about what happens if we don't get there by 2050. Yeah, that, that's, that's the other way of thinking about it. So something has to happen, and that's why these discussions around sustainability are so very important. I'm going to take... If you don't mind, unless you've, if you've got something earth-shattering you want to say on that. Do you want to, Peter? No? Okay. I think just to our last question, sorry, our last question, Duncan, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask, um, how do you think AI will affect um, the progress or the effect? Of, how do you think AI will affect um, sustainability in the future? Because we have been shown that terms like chat GPT to other open source models have shown um, a lot of progress. So they could, and people are predicting that AI could disrupt a lot of industries. How do you think AI could be used to, say, in sustainability, but also, maybe not also, but also other industries, or how it could affect it like, positively or negatively, and so on? 
Yeah. I'll go first with a quick answer, and then I'll hand over. Um, so, interestingly enough, this is another thing that came up in our discussion group today. Um, so, I don't know if anyone spotted it, but there was an article over the weekend where the uh, CEO of Octopus Energy was talking about the impact of AI affecting their business, and something like 10,000 jobs are going to go at a period of time. They can envisage where that's going to happen. But also, it was Alan and Overy have also been talking about within the legal field how um, how this technology is impacting on their business as well. And it's increasing productivity. That's what they're saying. It's sort of reducing something like two hours of work per person. But if you times that out by like 1,500 people, two hours of work, 1,500 people, it becomes quite a scalable uh, increase in productivity. So how is it going to affect sustainability? Well, you know, it's a difficult question to answer. I think in some ways it can make things happen more quickly. Um, but in other ways, it's going to be more challenging for the people because potentially what we'll see or potentially what we might find is there will be job losses as part of the things such as AI being used in that way. But also, you know, just around AI being used for things like recruitment and biases that come from recruitment. And there's, there's, it just keeps on going on and on. So it's a very long, um, long answer with a lot of different um, prongs to it, really, is what I would say. Um, thanks. I, th I think, uh, yeah, it's absolutely it must be right that there will be lots of changes in employment. Um, but we've been th through these sort of revolutions before. Uh, I think we'll probably find that there will be a lot of new jobs created in new fields, perhaps as yet unheard of or even undesigned yet. But they will come. I mean, I think one of the big innovations that AI is going to bring is the digital twin concept. And some of you may have come across this, the single synthetic environment, so-called. And this is where you know, you'll build a digital twin of a city and you'll model up various scenarios and how to make things more efficient. So what happens if there's a traffic jam one end of London? What, uh, what is the, the impact the other end? Because all the people will be modeled from uh, knowing where, exactly where they are and the population movements from your mobile phones. So in this respect, I think it will help us go a long way towards sustainability and will actually sort of I improve it because we'll be able to be more precise on modeling different scenarios that are going to go on in, in, in our communities. I'll be brief. Um, but to tie actually your question back to the last question, about net zero targets by 2050. Um, I mean, I think that's important. It focuses the mind, doesn't it? But actually, um, I'm an optimist. And if you think about, that's well, 27 years, isn't it, till 2050. If you think about 27 years ago from where we are now, we barely had the internet at that point. Business was completely different. So I do have, I am optimistic that AI and, and various other kinds of technology that we can't even imagine right now will transform our lives and potentially address some of these big sustainability challenges. I'm going to be trying to be fair to you. Is it a quick question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I hope so. <laughs> okay. Make the question as long as you want. As long as we can get some quick answers, we'll make yours the final question. Thank you. Can I get the panel to agree that in 60 seconds that Milton Friedman was right all along and that it's going to be market-based solutions that are going to fix this problem. So, very quick example. There's a fish, robo-fish, swimming up and down the Thames, gobbling up plastic. Was that the council, Westminster Council, and the councillors that designed that and put that there? Or was it a company and the council bought it from them? So, rather than tax everyone, isn't a better to solution to give a tax break to firms to do more things like that? Gosh, um, I think the answer was it was probably an entrepreneur who designed it, who probably got some EIS or VCT money from the government and a tax break from all you guys. Uh, and the people who invested in the VCT and the EIS were probably wealthy businessmen who'd made lots of profits from their other businesses. So there you go. That's, uh, that's my input. No, we're good. There you go. Long question, quick answer. So, right. Thank you. So I, 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 there's a very quick series of thank yous I'd like to make before we break up. So firstly, and I think most importantly to our illustrious panel, and also to Tim for his excellent lecture earlier. So if we could just <laughs> round of applause for those folks. <laughs> a 
And just a few other quick thank yous. I'm not sure if anyone from Drapers is in the room, but thank you, Drapers, for your, your fantastic hospitality once again. Uh, we always love being here and being amongst you. Thank you to our clerk, wherever he is, roving reporter, microphone runner, for a great job. Fellow entrepreneurs for all of their support today. So I think, actually, for those that were in the sessions, a little thank you to everybody that, that gave up their time to kind of give that hour to you. So maybe a little round of applause for, for those folks. <laughs> So um, thank you on behalf of the company for uh, the, the visiting masters that have come spared some time with us and other, other guests that have been with us. But actually, I think most importantly, all, thank you to you students for coming along and making this such an excellent day because this would just not happen without you being here and your young, bright minds. And I, I don't know what you guys think. I thought the question was absolutely excellent. So. And I suppose, students, we better thank your teachers for letting you come along as well. So, uh, thank you, teachers. And that's it. If we, if, if we had an end of class bell, we'd ring it. But thank you again for everybody coming, and we'll see you again in 2024.